So we're here in my home studio. I have two. This is a small space for uh, when I don't want to work in extreme cold or extreme heat. Um, what I've got set up is a palette, and most of you at home will not have the palettes that have been accessible to you at the university. So what I would recommend is just a simple piece of chipboard or a piece of wood that you've put a clear coat on. And a clear coat can be the simple fixative that you use on your drawings from a charcoal drawing, or it can be just a simple clear polyurethane. It's all made of the same thing. So what I've done is I've done two coats of that in order to seal this so that it doesn't actually leach the oil away. So if I didn't seal it, what would happen is, is I would have a little bit of less, um, I would have a far more viscous material and I wouldn't be able to move it around as easily. So just to review about my palette, I'll go through the colors. I've not labeled them. So it is primarily in the order that I'd like you to keep your palette in. Remember we talk about retaining a good um, working order of the palette. I keep the first colors in all of the warm temperatures. So titanium white, cadmium yellow, yellow ochre, uh, cadmium red, alizarin crimson, alizarin crimson um, burnt sienna, and burnt umber. And those are my warms. From there, I go on to my cools. So I've got my sap green. I don't have a terra verte on me here, um, so we'll just use the sap green for today for the demo. My cerulean blue, which uh, is the sky blue. It's fairly expensive. It is toxic. Keep your fingers out of it. Um, the ultramarine blue. And then for those of you who actually do have a black, I'm going to show you um, how you can mix a green from a black. Um, you'll note that I've got a fairly simple setup. I keep a rag to wipe off my brushes. I also keep my medium open, and I use a little bit of a different medium than you all have that I've started to use at school, which is the non-toxic um, solvent-free gel or solvent-free medium. I use a substance called Galkid, and it's sold by a company called Gamblin. Um, and what this is is the same thing that you use. Uh, it's an alkyd medium, which basically dry, the drying time is about 24 hours, and the working, the working process is primarily um, wet for wet and sticky for about 10 working hours so it should be dry overnight um, it it moves around like oil um, it does yellow over time so I try not to use too much of it um, I do use non-toxic um, solvent at home much like you do um, it's the exact same material we use at school so it's terpenoid natural it has absolutely no scent to it um, and I have a little bit of a different container than you do I've spent a little bit of money on it and what this is, it's a container that holds the sediment down at the bottom. And so I am able to lift and utilize this cup, which keeps my brush suspended outside of any of the, um, any of the sandy color agents that are used in order to make your paint. So we'll keep that over here. I like to keep it on the level surface. Um, and then we'll begin by talking about flesh color. Um, so the best way to start talking about flesh color is to work with your own. And as you work and look at the various things that are going on in your flesh color, and I'm a very pale Caucasian flesh tone, is the temperature. And the first thing you want to think about, is it a cool temperature that you're working with or a warm temperature? So I've got a yellowish um, tint to my flesh. It's a, some might call it a kind of orange. Um, and then it sort of moves into a more alizarin crimson, much more cooler. In definition. So if I'm working from um, my subject, my easy, easy subject here, which is my hand, I can start with a little bit of white and theoretically I can make every single flesh tone based on the three primaries and white. So we'll start with that. I have my cadmium yellow, I have my cadmium red, and what I've got is a very simple flesh tone. Um, it gets more complex when it gets a little bit darker. So if I'm moving into maybe a shadow, um, I might push my yellow, go back to my cadmium red, and then touch on my ultramarine blue as a darkening agent. And so what that will actually look like is a fairly dark, uh, much more complex version of what's going on in my flesh tone. And as I add white, you'll see that it's far more accurate in terms of light. So that's the basic fundamental uh, of, a, of a Caucasian flesh color. 
but you'll note that I have two variants of every single color that have been offered to you in the spectrum here. It's still a fairly limited palette, but I've got two versions of yellow, two versions of red, two versions of brown, two versions of green typically, and two versions of blue. So if I start with my dirtier, muddier version of my yellow, and I move to my alizarin crimson, which is my darker, dirtier version of my red, uh, which is a cooler red, and I work in a sort of pendulum back and forth between those colors, what I'm able to find is a little bit more of a variant of pink. And I can soften that up by adding yellow. But the next question is, is how do I actually darken that up? So if I take the same base tone of my Caucasian flesh, to flesh color, which is a sort of medium orange there, and I drop the complement in. And we're gonna say that the complement to a Caucasian flesh tone is actually green. Um, we never add black to flesh, ever. It doesn't matter how dark the flesh is. If I add my green, what you'll note, as I tease that into the color arrangement, is also have something that looks pretty much like a brown, a warm brown. And as I tease that in, I'll add more dimensionality to that value of color. Um, if I clean out my brush, and I always keep a little rag handy for that as well, and I can close that if I don't want to smell anything at all. Um, what I would want to do is basically start playing around with my browns. So if I'm still thinking about a Caucasian flesh color, I can make a very, very simple one uh, if it's on the warm end of the temperature range by simply adding my burnt sienna. And so what I'm getting here is a little bit more of a richer, warmer tone of flesh. If I add my burnt umber into that burnt sienna, I'm gonna have an even darker value. And you might have that uh, in a very darkly lit space. If I add blue to that, however, what that's gonna do is cool it off. So I tend to advise students not to add really very, very little, if any, blue. But you might see that on a very, very dark skin tone. So you'll note that it still possesses a warm temperature. However, that cooling agent allows us to reach a certain dimensionality with the value scale. Um, so I'm gonna clean out my brush. And here's the problem. If I apply a logic that everything that gets lighter gets whiter, you're not gonna actually reach a matched flesh tone. So just to reiterate that the light from the window or the light from the sky, the sun, is gonna be a cool light so a blue light, and the light from a incandescent light, which is directly above me, is gonna be a yellow light. I have to think about the, how the temperature is gonna to react to the flesh tone. So if what my intention is to do is to cr create a facsimile of the color arrangement that I'm seeing, what I wanna think about is rather than adding white, and I'll do that just for the sake of argument here, if I'm adding white to that, that I just mixed. It's not gonna read as a very lively flesh tone. In fact, most people are never gonna be that flesh tone. Uh, they might be the lightest version of that, and I might be able to add a little bit of red to that in order to warm it up a little bit. But for the most part, we don't add white to a flesh tone uh, in someone who is not Caucasian. Typically what we wanna add, or what we wanna look for, is a warmer variant of that. So if I take that color that I just mixed, so burnt sienna, a little bit of burnt umber, and I add yellow to it, I'm gonna get a far warmer flesh tone that's gonna be much more unsafe, say, um, uh, someone who's sort of living in the medium range of uh, tints. Uh, it's still warm, um, but the problem is, is if I apply a logic that, in the exact same way about the darkening agent, um, if I use blue to that, what's gonna look like is a zombie. Um, so I tend to avoid blue in flesh because it tends to look like it's gonna um, rot. If I do add brown, or sorry, green to that, it's gonna create what we know of as olive skin tone. And so that olive skin tone is far more prevalent than something like a blue skin tone. And a blue skin tone, if I take blue and I take burnt umber, that's gonna create a black. 
There's nothing warm about that. That person does not exist. So if I do have a very dark color arrangement to someone's flesh tone, the local color of their flesh is something around this. So if we go back to our burnt umber and our burnt sienna, and I lay that down, what you're more often going to see as a light highlight within that flesh tone, it's going to be more on the violet scale. So I want to keep looking for a violet and I want to kind of keep that off to my side as I create my flesh palette. So I'm going to use ultramarine and a little bit of the, um, the alizarin crimson. And that violet is going to act as Now it's gonna be fairly dark here, so if I lay that down, you might on very rare occasions see that as a potential um, value, a dark value. But if I add white to that, what you're gonna find is oftentimes on that dark flesh tone, and that doesn't exist, but on these dark flesh tones, you're gonna to find that as a highlight, and it's gonna be far lighter than how I created it. So something like that. That'll be at the tip of the nose, along the ridge of the nose, something like that. Um, the other thing that you want to look for on occasion is on very light Caucasian flesh tone or medium flesh tone. So if we go back to that again here, you're oftentimes going to see a little bit of a baby blue. So if I take a good deal copious amount of white and I add a little bit of my cerulean, and you notice that's a surreal, it's a real cerulean, so it's um, not a hue, so it, it has a tinting capacity that is kind of profound. I would find that oftentimes in that color arrangement, and then on the medium color arrangement. Um, so that's something to look out for. Always look out for um, something that is very, very close to a very, very light purple, or a very, very light blue in any flesh tone. Don't always go to white. There are only a few white, pure white spots on flesh when you're painting them, and it might be the tip of the nose, it might be within the, uh, within the iris, or within the, the whites of the eye. And much like any other part of flesh in that you don't see pure white, you also don't see pure white for eyes. So typically what you're gonna see for the whites of the eyes is something very close to that blue, and a touch of your burnt umber in order to create a gray. And so that's what you're gonna see for the whites of the eye, not pure white. And those whites of the eye, now if I mix that brown again, or that, sorry, that um, gray again, I've got my burnt umber, I've got my ultramarine, that's what you're gonna find is gonna actually be the shadow structure of the top of the whites of the eye. Um, the other thing that you wanna think about is a potential green that is not already on your palette. So if I take yellow ochre and I add a little bit of the black, now I know I didn't ask you to have black on there, but some of you might actually have it. What I'm gonna make is an olive. And that olive is a fair, fairly cool olive. Um, it's one that oftentimes you will not see in flesh, but if you look very, very hard, sometimes you will see that as a sort of shadow agent. If I add my various warm tones to it, lots more can happen. So there's a variety of ways to make flesh tone happen. And the big thing is, is never trust what you know, trust what you see. So to reiterate, the variance of a flesh tone can be mixed with your basic primaries, yellow, red, and blue. However, you have all of this range of color on your palette in order to extend that and create a complexity and dimensionality to that. The other thing you want to think about, and I'll end on this, is the colors of the mouth um, and the insides of the nose. So if we clean out our brush, you want to think a couple of things. If I've got tip a typical light lighting situation of lighting overhead or lighting on the side, the upper lip is almost always darker than the lower lip. And you're gonna have these moments of fissure that we talk about a lot in class where two things meet, creating a very, very dark, dense line. That line is not black. So if what we're thinking about is a mouth, specifically my mouth, and I'm not looking at it in the mirror right now, but I painted it a few times. If I take my alizarin crimson and I add the exact same color that I would utilize for flesh tone, so a little bit of yellow ochre, 
What I'm going to have is something really, really close to my mouth. Now, that might be a little too dark, but it's a good place to start because we always start with the local value. If I add white to that, I'm going to have a lower lip. And it'll be a far more accurate match. Now the question is, is how do I add dimensionality to that? Well, I've added white there, and what I want to do is I want to think about the turn of the mouth, that fissure line. And that fissure line is never ever black. I never ever ever use black and flesh tone. So what I'm going to look for is the darkest variant of that red, and I'm going to take my lizard and crimson with no white, and I'm going to take my burnt umber and add just a little bit to it, and it's going to create what looks a little bit like a dark, dark, ruddy purple. Um, and so if what I do is I simply create that line, that'll add some of the darkness in order to turn my mouth into something that works. Typically the mouth will be darker there. I might have a little bit of a uh, turn or plane. And then I want to think about what I would do in terms of um, light. I said that you'll oftentimes see a lot of uh, this very, very light purple. I might pop that on there. I might also see that in terms of a filtrum there, which is the part of the lip that turns outward. So I can simply take, take a, a brush that is smaller and I can feather that in. And if I think about how that works in terms of the flesh that I am painting, turn that form and make a believable dimensional projection. Now there's all sorts of things going around in our mouth and we'll talk about that in my next uh, tutorial, but essentially that's the basic fundamentals of what's going on with flesh tone. So that's it. Um, join me for the next tutorial and we'll talk about how to actually paint a head. Thank you.